Top 10, top I got a top 10, 10. Top 10. Got my motivation high for my top 10 Gotta learn from the wise women and men Need motivation? What's the top 10? Believe Nation. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael, and this channel was created to help you overcome the number one challenge that is holding you back, a lack of belief in yourself. You watch these videos because you know there's something greater inside you as well. You've got Michael Jordan level talent at something. So get ready to change the story that you're telling yourself, control your thoughts, and stop wasting your time with Sam Harris and my take on his top 10 rules of success to give you the belief that you need. Okay, let's kick it off with rule number one. Change the story you tell yourself. The normal range of psychological suffering, you know, not clinical depression, but just feeling like, you know, life sucks and you're a failure and there's nothing, you know, it's like uh, you're just, it's, you're stuck. That is a story of telling yourself a story. You're thinking and you can either become more and more mindful of that and interrupt that more and more uh, and or, and it, and it should be and, you can reframe this continually and tell yourself a better story, right? You can actually just engineer, you know, you, you can change the code that you're, that you're, you know, uh, running moment to moment. And I mean, just you know, a very simple one, which I, you know, I use, and I actually recently recorded this in a lesson on the app, uh, you know, just gratitude, just thinking this is actually, you know, this particular maneuver is, uh, I believe comes from Stoic philosophy. I, I didn't actually get it from Stoic philosophy, but this, this sort of use of negative imagination where you think of all of the bad things that haven't happened to you, right? So if you're just, you know, if you're stuck in traffic, driving to the job that you don't like, and you're, you're frustrated, uh, you can think of all the things that could happen to you, right, that haven't. And if any one of them happened to you, you would consider your prayers answered if you could just be returned to this moment, right? Like you haven't been diagnosed with cancer, right? You've got two young kids, say, you know, you want to live to see them grow up, and you could be the guy who today is going to find out you've got two months to live, right? And you have to, then the next two months is spent just unwinding your worldly affairs, right? You're not that guy, right? That hasn't happened to you yet. That's just more th thinking, but it can have a profound effect. You can, you can reframe your experience in a way that doesn't actually change anything material about your circumstance, and it can let the, the light in. Rule number two, control your thoughts. And this is where, you know, worry is almost always pointless because like in each moment, there's either something you can do to solve a problem or there isn't, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if there is something to do, well, then just do that thing, right? Do, solve the problem, right? If there isn't, there's actually nothing to worry about. Like, like be, the worry adds nothing to that situation, right? So you're, so, you know, if you have a brain tumor, Yes, you need to go from one doctor to and probably to a second doctor for a second opinion, and you, you find the surgeon you you want. And there's a whole process. You're going to get an MRI. You know all of it. You're 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 having to deal with a lot of yes, objectively stressful things. But I mean, big picture, we're all in this situation. I mean, life itself is a brain tumor. I mean, we're, we're all going to die. We're all we're all we are all going to go on this. We're going to get the full tour you now. I mean, for some of us, it, you know, some of us will be very lucky, and it will be very orderly and free of pain, and we'll be surrounded by everyone we love. We're 100 years old. Yeah, yeah, it's just going to go perfectly. And for some people, it'll be chaotic and terrifying and short or long. I mean, so it, it, like it's every permutation, and I'm not uh, denying that it's rational to have preferences there, right? I mean, like, you know, you, you do want the orderly, loving, right. uh, you know, uh, you know uh, and not untimely unraveling of it all um, uh, rather than the opposite. But it's whatever is happening, you have this moment and then you're thinking. And, I mean, and, and, you're, and you're thinking about the future and you're thinking about the, fat, the past is the mechanism by which you will truly suffer mm. in each moment.
because it is in fact true to say that even physical pain is something around which you can develop an impressive ability to be equanimous, right? And we and we also have, you know, we have, you know, for extreme pain, we have painkillers. I mean, like happily, we're living, we're not living in, in you know, 1700, mm-hmm. where, you know, someone is just kind of sawing off your limb, Suffering. you know, you know, uh, um, after the leeches didn't work. Uh, so, um, you know, 99% of our suffering around everything, you know, even objectively horrible things like brain tumors, is our thought about past and future, is the regret. And it, I mean, it's, 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 it's the, the story we're telling ourselves. Rule number three, start valuing your time. Now, most of us do our best not to think about death, but, but the, there's always part of our minds that knows this can't go on forever. We, we, the, part of us always knows that we're just a doctor's visit away or a, a phone call away from being starkly reminded with, with the fact of our own mortality or of those closest to us. Now, I'm sure many of you in this room have experienced this in some form. You, you, you must know how uncanny it is to suddenly be, be thrown out of the normal course of your life and just be given the, the full-time job of not dying or caring for someone who is. But the, the one thing people tend to realize at moments like this is that they wasted a lot of time when life was normal. It's not just what they it's not just what they did with their time. It's not just that they spend too much time working or, or compulsively checking email. It's, it's that they they cared about the wrong things. They they regret what they cared about. Their their attention was bound up in petty concerns. That year after year, when life was normal. And, and this is a paradox, of course, because. We all know this epiphany is coming. Don't you know this is coming? Don't you know that there's going to come a day when you'll be sick or someone close to you will die and you'll look back on the kinds of things that captured your attention and you'll think, what what was I doing? You, You know this and yet if you're like most people, you will spend most of your time in life tacitly presuming you'll live forever. I mean, it's like watching a bad movie for the fourth time. Yeah. Or, or bickering with your spouse. I mean, this, these things only make sense in light of eternity. Rule number four, be fully present. So much of, our, of, of what we're thinking is making us miserable, right? So much of it is unpleasant. So much of it is causing anxiety. We got. We, you look at your to-do list. You got fifty things on it. You just feel like, oh my, uh, there's just the day is not long enough, right? This is, the, you know, the state, and that's a good, you know, that's a you know a high class problem to have, right? There, might, you know, there are worse problems. Uh, this is the state we're in, and the obverse of that is when we're really just connecting with life in a joyful, creative, beautiful way. Like when you look out the window and it's the most beautiful sunset ever, and you are just looking at the sunset, right? You're not, like you're fully connected with its beauty. Uh, Those are all moments where you're losing this sense of, of self. But the difference between meditation and those moments is that you're not really aware of losing the sense of self in those moments. You're not, you're not really aware of what is uh, freeing about those moments, and you can't do it in other circumstances. Like, like you can't, like you know, I need the I need the beautiful sunset. Just looking at your shoe isn't good enough for me, right? But with with meditation, I can actually look at your shoe in the same way that I look at the sunset. Right? So that's the like what's 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 happening for people. Most people is that they're waiting for the world to give them a good enough reason to just be present and to be present so fully that they lose their sense of, of self, right? That they're no longer behind their face, you know, just waiting for something good to happen, mm. right? Or, or figuring out how to change the, the experience enough so that, again, they can stop, they're, they're no longer at war. I mean, we're, 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 to a greater or lesser degree, we're always at war 
I mean, we're, we're always fighting something. You know, there's always this like, you know, you're always noticing something wrong. You're feeling uncomfortable in your body. You're reacting to something that somebody did or you thought they did. You're navigating a social encounter that seems off kilter. You know, it's awkward and like you're trying to figure out what to say. And that would, that sounded stupid. And you know, like you're, you're, you're just being blown around. And the moments where you really feel good are moments where you can, you are, there, there isn't a, a, a coming to rest, right? Where it's not about the past or future. You know, it's, it's not even about, it's not about half a second ago, and it's not about half a second from now. And the ultimate version of that is to, ju- to uh, entails the dropping of this, this sense of self. Also, if you wanna learn from other successful writers, check out my 254 Writer's Wisdom series. It's free. The link to join is in the description below. Clock time is fine. But psychological time is when the future takes over your mind and your entire thought patterns are geared only towards future. It's not enough to know what you want. You have to, to do what you want, to be what you want. Any time I deviated from that love and went into something else, I just was so unhappy. Rule number five, achieve mindfulness. How do we unlock our consciousness or expand it in a positive way? There's a sort of trivial versions of mindfulness and there's the the deeper version. And and the deeper version is really to understand the mechanics of your own mental suffering and put yourself in a position to to cease to suffer unnecessarily, right? So you you notice that that you're lost in thought almost every moment of your life and much of your thinking has this, this mediocre character of of causing you to worry about the, the future and and regret the past mm-hmm. and and just feel a a, a baseline disease with life right whether whether it is just you know what it was like for me to drive here in traffic and like oh, am I going to be late you know I'm supposed right. to be here at ten o'clock and like so all like like so much of our life is the steady hum of that kind of uh, thinking right and. Uh, not to mention the you know the bigger concerns about you know disease and you know whether your child is sick and like oh, we're thinking like we, we we're plunged into thought in each moment and we don't notice it mm. and until you learn to be mindful you can't notice it all you got I me mean, you, you might have this abstract idea that yeah of course I'm thinking a lot of the time but you know so what or like what well, yeah, how you know what's the alternative right there is no alternative you're just each thought will arise and completely capture your attention, and then you are hostage to the the emotional and behavioral imperatives of that thought, right? So, uh, and, so and and it's necessary to, to to some degree to be that way because we need we need thought. I mean, we, we thought is the way we we organize our lives and and form plans and and, and understand what's happening, right? So, like it's a, yeah. a, almost. <clears throat> Everything that makes us human is born of our capacity for abstract thought and to, and planning and goal formation and all the rest. But it's possible to recognize thought as uh, a stream of appearances in consciousness, and to recognize that consciousness is a the kind of the prior condition of their arising. And when you can do that, you can actually break the link between thought and psychological suffering. So like, so if you, if so, the thought is a, an, ang- an anxiety producing thought, right? You can notice this whole process where a thought arises and you feel anxious and that feeling of anxiety in your body, uh, uh, when once uninspected, begins to generate the, the motive for further thoughts along those lines. Mm-hmm. So you're thinking about the thing that makes you anxious and because you're anxious, you you're finding the anxiety intolerable. You've got resistance to feeling this this feeling, and you're thinking about like, how can I get out of this? And like, oh, okay, clearly, I got, I've got a lot. I've got to change here. Let me get a, you know, I'm gonna start writing some things down on a checklist, you know. And you're 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 thinking without knowing that you're thinking, and you're feeling the motive force of this this emotion. But if you once you can become mindful, which is is which is to just be aware of what's arising in, in consciousness without judgment, without reaction, without resistance, right? I mean, so, so to be able to notice anxiety as a, just a pattern of sensation in the body, right? And then when you can do that, you can see that, for, first of all, 
it's not that bad, right? right, right. In fact, you're you, not you, dying. Yeah, no, and and under under a different framing, it's a sensation that is that is often pleasant, right? Like the 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 the, the, the excitement you feel, or even the anxiety you feel before you get on a roller coaster, right? If that's your thing. Is something you're you're willing to pay to do, <laughs> right? Like, about, yeah. yeah, you want this thing. <laughs> you want that's part of the experience. You go skydiving, yeah, whatever. It, like, like that's yeah. that's the, you know the the being able to. Ha- I mean, the thrill is a thrill because you have you felt some of that, right? Yeah. Rule number six: change your perspective. Unless experience lasts forever, there's no point. It means nothing. So so just just try to map this onto your life. You know, every good meal you've had, every. Uh, uh, pleasant experience as opposed to an unpleasant one, every relationship, none of it means anything because it ends. You know, it, a good movie is meaningless, it's no better than a bad movie because it ends. Uh, this, is a, this is a strange idea. This is a, unless we disappear into infinity with experience, there's no difference between the most sublime happiness and the most abject suffering. And I, I think when you actually try to connect with that intuition, it's, uh, it's strange and uh, really is insupportable in our moment-to-moment experience. We care very deeply about the character of our experience. In fact, it's the only thing we can care about. And I think quite to the contrary, this notion of eternity, this notion of uh, nothing matters here, but it matters in... Uh, over the, over the long haul in the afterlife, uh, because the bulk of our experience is in is is after we die, uh, this religious idea is actually robs life of its meaning. It doesn't bring meaning to life. It renders meaningless all of the uh, precious moments we have while alive. I and mean, th- this is the only life we're certain of. And it's continually ending. It not only ends in death, but it ends in each moment. And and things change. Uh, and that makes each moment precious. So when you, you take a, an experience like, um, you know, if you're a new parent and you're, you're carrying your child, say, what you do, you pick your child up hundreds of times uh, a day, it seems, and uh, you never think that there's going to be a last time you do that. I mean, at a certain point, your child's going to get too heavy to pick up. Uh, you, know, you, don't, you don't pick up 15-year-olds for the most part. At a certain point, you will have picked your child up for the last time. Now, we, we tend not to go through life thinking in those terms, but if we did, if we realized that it's as though we're standing in front of a kind of a ticket machine at a deli counter and we're just pulling tickets, not knowing how many are in there, and we just, at a certain point, you pull and you've got the last one in hand for every experience. Uh, you know, there'll be a last time you pick your child up and you will not have noticed that was the last time. That makes life very precious, and certainly death, the, you know, the, the, the final ticket at the end of life, makes it all incredibly precious. It's just, it, it could not be more precious. Uh, and its preciousness is not predicated on it lasting forever, as though such a thing uh, could even make sense. Rule number seven, live in the moment. Do you think there, that there is an answer to that question, that, that uh, meaning to one's existence can be found through a spiritual quest of the type that you talk yeah, about? Yeah, I think it's the wrong question. It's just, it's a question that seems to create a space that, for an answer that now needs to be filled in, and the fact that we can't fill it in perfectly is considered some kind of problem. But I do think it's, it's the wrong question, because the meaning, you don't ask that. Whenever you're having an experience that is deeply fulfilling, and you're really just, you're not distracted by thought, you're, you're not waiting for the next good thing to happen, you're not looking over the shoulder of the present moment, to see what's coming, you're just totally with whatever it is, you're not then worrying about what it means. I mean, that's, this is something that's a, it's a, you have to do something in order to find that question interesting, and the thing you're doing is less interesting than really being connected to the present moment. And if in the present moment, there is, there's no, if you're not lost in thought, and you're truly just kind of surrendered to consciousness in the present moment, whether it's pleasant or unpleasant, there's no, you don't have to think of the the grand design of your life. Now, it's, it's not to say that there's, you can't ask big questions about you know the arc of your life. You know what you want your life to look at, and what would be you know if you t- if you look at what would be a great way to spend the next ten years. I mean, those those are value laden questions that we can ask and plan for, and all that's fine. But the meaning of existence that 
That's meaning a, or, or reason for your existence. I mean, yeah, but you see a reason. But for I don't. Your you know, I I almost never. You know, to to get up in the morning and get to the coffee pot, I don't need a reason other than I want coffee. <laughs> You know, and basically the rest, of, most of life works that way, and even the most profound moments work that way. So it's like when I'm holding my, my eight-month-old daughter in my hands, and she smiles, and I smile back, and there's that moment of just, just you know, she's now like the cutest thing in, in the world. Um, there's no, I don't need to, to, to abstract away from that and say, well, what does this mean? And I mean, that, that's like, it's a failure to connect. That that I would that that the answer to that question would help me overcome presumably, right? It's, it's, it's only, the, the implicit in that question is if we had an answer, well then life would be better. But why not just do the thing with your attention that would actually make life better? That's uh, yeah. rule number eight: read. I know there are ways that are recommended to read a book so as to extract the, the you know the, the actionable information as as quickly as possible from it. I have never been uh, uh, an adopter of any of those ways. So, like you know, and I mean, worse still, I basically read everything at the same speed. So, like, I read everything like it's scripture. So, if it's you know, you know, People Magazine in a, the waiting room of a dentist's office, I'm reading that at the same speed that I'm reading you know, a, a work of philosophy or neuroscience. And the big change of late, I mean, the, you know, I guess this probably happened somewhere around ten years ago, is that w once I realized that. There's functionally an infinite amount of information to consume. You know, it's doubling in the sciences every three to five years, and you know there are literally thousands of good books that I will wish I had read, but I will never get around to reading. Um, I've become a very fickle reader uh, in the sense that I, you know, I, I cut my losses very early. The sunk cost fallacy has completely disappeared for me. The idea that I've, you know, spent five hours or five days on this thing. So I better just finish it, right? That used to be my orientation with respect to reading books. Now I'll, I'll discard a book, uh, you know, just on a whim because I know there's a, an infinite amount of stuff I want to read. You know, I don't go into the table of contents and look at the structure of the book and then go to the index and then look at the topics and then, I mean, I, I just start on page one and start reading and then when I get bored, I stop, you know, and... Uh, so that's, uh, you know, do, it, do, with what, do with that life hack what you will. Rule number nine, question everything. Most of humanity, even at this moment, doesn't have the free attention to really think seriously about what it means to be happy. You know, it's just, I mean, it's, it, well, you just look at the economic imperatives of, you know, most people in most situations. It's not about uh, really having the, the free attention to do whatever you want or what you, what you, what you would think at the end of the day uh, would be most satisfying. It's right? about so, survival, more yeah, basic needs. And yeah, yeah, and and or just you're living in a situation of stark political insecurity, right? right? You're just worried about you know what sort of violence may happen in the street later today, or like what you what you may or may not say mm -hmm. that could get you jailed, right? It's you know, crazy. so it's it's not so like so so much of human history has been just for figuring out how to get strangers to cooperate reliably enough so that they have the free attention to explore the things we want to explore so that, yeah, we can figure out why, you know, why we're dying from diseases and then, you know, cancel them, right? So, right. like, like just, just, to, just to be able to do science is a luxury, right? Sure. And, um, and this is where, I mean, you know, as you probably know, I've spent a lot of time criticizing organized religion uh, because... You know, historically and even currently, so much of it is hostile to. I mean, so, so much of it is putting in place of, of of real curiosity and a real search for answers. Iron Age fictions that just got you know codified in books mm -hmm. that can't be edited, right? So, in my view, the the main tool we have to navigate now, and this has always been the case, but it's it's just more and more imperative that we realize this, the main tool is human conversation. And what every religion is, is a, an insistence by a certain group of people uh, that we anchor ourselves to a conversation that, that was held hundreds or thousands of years ago, right? So, and, right. And so it's like you, either you want to have the best ideas actionable and, and, and uh, interpretable now, or you want to be hostage to what you know, your great 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 grandfather and grandmother thought was true about the nature of reality, and if you go back far enough, 
you're talking to people who knew absolutely nothing that a sixth grader knows today. And rule number 10, the last one before a very special bonus clip, is be grateful. I noticed this at dinner the other night with my family. Everyone seemed to be in a fairly mediocre frame of mind. We were all in some way disgruntled or stressed out. I had a million things I was thinking about. And I suddenly noticed how little joy we were all taking in one another's company. And then I thought, if I had died yesterday and could have the opportunity to be back with my family, I thought of how much I would savor this moment right now. And it totally transformed my mood. It gave me instantaneous access to my best self and to a feeling of pure gratitude for the people in my life. Just think of what it would be like to lose everything and then be restored to the moment you're now in, however ordinary. You can reboot your mind in this way, and it need not take any time. The truth is you know exactly what it's like to feel overwhelming gratitude for your life. You are in an unusual situation. There are at least a billion people on Earth at this moment who would consider their prayers answered if they could trade places with you. There are at least a billion people who are suffering debilitating pain or political oppression or the acute stages of bereavement. To have your health, even just sort of, to have friends, even only a few, to have hobbies or interests and the freedom to pursue them, to have spent this day free from some terrifying encounter with chaos is to be lucky. Just look around you and take a moment to feel how lucky you are. You get another day to live on this earth. Enjoy it. Now I've got a special bonus clip from Sam on how to focus on doing the things that matter that I think you're gonna enjoy. But before that, it's time for the three point landing questions. Let's go from just watching a video to taking action. Here we go. Question number one, what are three things that you are grateful for today? Number two, What's the biggest perspective shift that you need to make consistently? And number three, where do you need to start valuing your time more? Now, if you like this video and you're gonna start taking some action after it, give me a hashtag believe down in the comments as well. What I'm spending my time doing is trying to engage honestly with interesting and consequential ideas. I mean, so the net, the, the, the the Venn diagram I, I have, you know, I don't, I don't think about it a lot, but when I think about, you know, retrospectively what I have been spending a lot of time doing, I, I seem to keep finding the intersection of intellectually interesting ideas. They have to have some con connection to science or philosophy or I mean, it just, it has to be the kind of thing that someone would may want to think about anyway because they're just cool ideas. So something like artificial intelligence, right? Very interesting to think about. But it's also hugely consequential, you know, increasingly so. And if we get it wrong, it will, you know, redound to our misery, right? If not extinction, right? So like that is that's the the center of the bullseye for me. Something that's interesting, something that's consequential, something that that getting it. The difference between getting it right and wrong is enormous, right? And that's so. It's, so those are that's sort of the landscape where I'm I'm trying to continually focus my conversations. And if you want to learn from another successful thought leader genius, check out the video right there next to me. I think you'll enjoy it. Continue to believe and I'll see you there. We would be living in a very, very different world. If you want to study something really practical in the 21st century, philosophy is a good bet.